Welcome everybody to another brand new episode of It's My Wrestling Podcast Indie Wrestling Spotlight Series. I'm your host as always, Chris Dees, and for my second ever episode of this brand new series, I am joined by the one and only, the Ronin, Mr. Brian Aidenson. Brian, how's it going, man? Uh, not too bad, mate. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad. I was just, well, I was just saying before, I'm not very, I'm not in very good health at the minute, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're joining me. That's perked me up a little bit. How are, um... How are things for you? It's like four o'clock. It's nice doing a nice early podcast. These are always in the evening. And if I'm talking to an American guest, it's like three o'clock for them. It's lovely doing one oh, earlier. It's different. Uh, I'll, I'll take it, definitely. <laughs> yeah. The last one I did was about nine, ten o'clock at night. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice getting the afternoon ones. Yeah, they always forget. Sometimes they're like, oh, can we do 6 a.m.? What's that for you? I'm like, oh, that's 11 a.m. for me. Yes, please. Let's do it. Please, God, let's do it. Because I just, yeah. Sign me up now. <laughs> I hate doing them late at night, man. It's horrible. Um, but no, like I said, man, thank you for joining me. This a brand new series. I've only just started doing it. I had um, Grey Wolf, yeah, Grey Wolf Raven Fawn as my first guest, and he was brilliant. Just a good opportunity to shine a bit of a spotlight, as the name suggests, on independent wrestlers, people who work just as hard as anybody, if not harder, as far as I'm concerned, but don't maybe get the eyes on them that they should do. So I want to start off um, a bit, little bit about your background, obviously, um, but I don't like to ask the same old questions of who was your favourite wrestler growing up or what's your first memory of wrestling or anything like that. So I wanted to ask you, what was the one moment or wrestler or match or event or promo or whatever it was when it clicked for you and you were like, yes, I have to be a wrestler and I'm going to do it. What was that one moment? If you can remember it, what was it that really inspired you to just go for it? Um, uh, my first memory of wrestling, I'd say, was watching WCW. Um, I think it was Jushin Thunder Liger versus Rey Mysterio. So I was big into Power Rangers as a kid. Um, <laughs> and obviously they look like real life Power Rangers, so automatically yeah. invested. Um but the bit that got me into it, I remember watching Ring of Honor, War of the Worlds, a few years back uh, with a couple of my best mates, Lee and Sean. Hello, if you're watching. Um, and basically, we, were out, we were having a few scoops and stuff, and I just said, I want to do that. And it was just as Tetsuya Naito was walking out, and he's got the massive coat, and you know, he's just absolutely beaming with charisma. And I was like, oh, that looks so cool. And then I had a couple of more pints. I was like, right, I've, I've convinced myself I'm, I'm going to do it. And then went to a training school and the rest is history. So you were a little bit older then. What what would you have been like, so like mid-teens or? Oh, no, I would have been, without giving me age away now, I'd have been about 26, 27. Wow. So oh. I got quite late. Yeah, really late to it. Yeah, most most wrestlers, especially indie wrestlers, tend to start sort of like mid-teens, don't they? Sort of like 13, 14, that sort of age. Was it was it easy for you at that age, at 26, that sort of age, to, to get into it? Or was it sort of like, did you ever doubt that maybe you were a bit too old? Um, I obviously had them doubts, yeah. Um, I obviously contemplated like, well, you know, am I a bit too old for this already to be taking bumps and stuff? But I think from having a martial arts background prior to doing this has helped me tenfold. So you learn little things like rolling and, and little bits of techniques that you can add in. So um, it, it, it's something I've wanted to do since I can remember. So mm. my way of getting into wrestling was through the martial arts route, which, you know, <laughs> didn't quite go to plan, but we're here now. So <laughs> it's all right. What was that martial arts background? Was that just something that you did just as like a hobby? Um, I was, I was, um, it was Shotokan Karate. Um, I'd done that since I was a kid. I got to Black Belt at the age of 12. Um, <laughs> so I, I was one of the, at the time, I was one of the youngest in the UK to do it. Um, and then I think about 10 months later, an 11 year old beat me to, be the, to the Black Belt. So my name got took out there. So I was gutted. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was, I was quite young. So I wasn't allowed to compete anymore because it was because of my age and the grading that I was at for karate. But you're not really allowed to compete. So your next time you can compete is when you're 18. So I sat that off and went to do like judo and other little bits and bits of kickboxing, other, or just stuff to keep me fit mainly. Um, and rugby as well. Rugby was another big one. Um, and then really all I was all I ever wanted to do was wrestling. But because there was no schools about or anything like that, I just. I had to try and keep myself occupied and then found that 
found the school I was at and then just went for it. So where, whereabouts, whereabouts are you based in the UK? Uh, I'm in the northwest. So I've recently moved to Manchester. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm all about that area at the minute. So were there, were there just not many schools around where you were at the time? I, don't, I think it's the same for me. I'm, I'm from Coventry, like Bang in the Midlands, and there's not really... There's not much going on around here in terms of wrestling either. It's got better over the years, obviously, but like from yeah. when we were kids, there was nothing at all. But now there's a few, but it's still pretty hard to find. I know there's um, Kamikaze Pro. I'm not sure how far that is away from you, but yeah, Kamikaze shows. The... They're brilliant. Yeah, I absolutely love Kamikaze Pro. Um, but yeah, it's like when I was growing up as a kid, there was like, I, I come from a small town called Witness, which is like in between. Yes. Um, it, it's like the armpit of the northwest. It's it's <laughs> shocking, um, but there was nothing around it. Uh, there, there wasn't even anything in Liverpool or Manchester, so it was difficult to find somewhere. But then, obviously, as time progresses and it gets more popular, there's more things that are coming up. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah even like I say, even around the Midlands, even in Coventry, I think really you've got to go to Birmingham for it to all really start like kicking off and finding proper schools and gyms and stuff like that. It's um, it's weird. You'd have thought it would have thought it would have blown up by now. It has blown up, hasn't it? Obviously, like, like the UK independent wrestling scene is huge. You name like Kamikaze. There's loads of independent promotions, even just in Coventry. But there's still not many avenues for people to get into it, other than just approaching those sort of those sort of places. I think it's changed now. Like obviously, the T-shirt and wearing now, Future Shock. They've got a school in Manchester. Um, you've got Claw in Liverpool. You've got. Uh, you know, Kamikaze in the, in the West Midlands. You have got loads of different schools, though, as well. Um, and I think it's easy to access now because you've got Alexa the internet. You can find a, you can find a wrestling school in five minutes on your phone. All you need to do is Google it now. Whereas back in the day, like, you would have had to go in, like, the yellow pages if, if you could and everything else. But even then, it would have been, like, London area and stuff. Whereas I think now like, you've got Claw coming up. They're, they're going to be opening again soon in Liverpool. Future shot, like I've said, there's loads. Um, yeah, anyone who wants to have a go of it as well, get yourself down. Cannot, cannot tell you to do it enough. And yellow pages. That takes me about the yellow yeah. pages. You'd be looking for no, you'd be looking for little um little like flyers and business cards like in the post office window, wouldn't you? Or or in like a post box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the little uh, little anything. tickets. Just don't look too far down the telephone box. <laughs> yes, good advice. Good advice. <laughs> no one uses telephone boxes anymore. Anyway, I can't remember the last time I've seen one. The last time I've seen one, um, someone was in it drunk. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> They're homeless shelters, aren't they? Really, that's all they are. No one uses one anymore. You put fifty p in it, and you get like a minute on the phone. I have not. Jesus, who's got a mobile now? Exactly, yeah, everyone's got a mobile. I, I don't even, I can't even think of one anywhere near me. Anyway, anyway, we're getting a bit off track and talking about um, about phone boxes a bit too much. Um, I was having a quick scroll down your your Twitter and your social media just to see like what events you had coming up and, and what you've been up to recently, what you've got coming up in the future. And the first thing that really struck me when I was, when I was scrolling down was just how active you are and how much you're promoting and pushing other events, like not even necessarily events that you're wrestling at, you're just pushing other events. I don't know if they're like people that you know or, or things that are going on around where you are, but like it's a beautiful thing to see because you normally, a lot of the time, obviously wrestling is a very individual business, isn't it? Everybody looking out for themselves. It's not very often that you see, other than on the indies, not very often that you see people sort of like rallying behind each other. How... How important in this day and age is social media for yourself personally as an independent wrestler? But can you also sort of, um, how do you manage the downside of it? Because obviously social media, Twitter especially, is a toxic, horrible place at the best of times. So like, how do you balance that? Because wrestlers, even independent wrestlers, are really easy targets for people, aren't they? Oh, it, the thing is though, if you're putting yourself out in, in the ether, so it doesn't matter in, in what, what realm it is you do it. It might be, you know, it might be indie wrestling, you might be football, you might knit cardigans, it doesn't matter. If you put yourself out there with whatever it is that you do, some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it. And it's, for me anyway, it's about focusing on the positive. So if you can help people, like the shows that I've promoted on my Twitter and Insta and all that stuff, that I'm not even on, like you've said, 
that's not to say that I don't want the show to do well. I don't want wrestling to do well. I don't want my friends who are on the show to do well. I, I want all of them to do well. Why would I not? Because if for me, the way I look at it is, all right, I might not be on that show, but then they might turn around and need someone. And I'd like them, ideally, to give me a call because I know that the minute I get that opportunity, I'll give them 100%. If they've got me friends on that show, I want them to do well. I want to absolutely smash it. And I want... I just want the scene to do well because if the scene's alive, then there's a chance for everybody to do as, as well as they can do and as well as they want to do. If we stop sharing stuff and stop stop all you know social media activity, if you will, then it's going to die off quick. And that's not what I want. I want it to rise and be as, as good as everybody wants it to be and better if you can. You know, do, do what it is you can to make this scene the best that it can be especially after all the speaking out stuff that we've had, which is horrible for everyone that's, that's been affected. Let's yeah. put a positive spin on it now and let's really turn it around. Yeah, God, it's already been a little while since that, hasn't it? Sort of like a year, year and a half, maybe. Was it No, was it pre-pandemic, I think, the speaking out, or sort of like just as we got into the pandemic, really? It, was, it wasn't too long ago, but it, we've, we've moved on from it really quickly and nicely, haven't we? Like, uh, we're starting to see the positive side of independent wrestling again and like you say it's it's because of people like you constantly pushing everybody hyping everybody up um and like you say it's 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 good for the scene it's good for the scene for to you know help it to grow because independent wrestling in the uk was was nothing for for a number of years and like i said a few times already just in the last two, like five or ten years it's really blown up like kamikaze pro and they're not even one of, they're not even one of the bigger bigger promotions are they the indie promotions but they are well known they get a lot of big names they've had the likes of like keith lee there um who was there the last time i went it was keith lee trent seven pete dunn has been there in the last few years as well have you ever have you ever had a chance to mix it up with any of these guys because they that's what i really like about uk independent wrestling you never know who's going to be there do you none of those guys were advertised for those shows i was at so have you ever had a i know you had a recent seminar not too long ago with jonathan gresham didn't you yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was mind blowing. That that was somewhere else. Um, I've not had the uh, the good fortune to have a match with anyone of that bigger caliber. I mean, I've shared the ring with Niwa, who was in progress before, um, and he chopped me that hard. I thought my nipple was in the back row at one point. It was a uh, yeah, that that was painful. Um, but no, like I said, I've not had the uh, the opportunity to mix it up with anyone of that caliber just yet. But you know, it's open. Um, you know, we're all getting on bigger shows now. For example, like there's a show I'm on TNT in Liverpool that's arguably one of the biggest in the UK. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be on that show, and it's going really well. You know, I, I just want everyone to go to every show if I can. I know I'm being greedy, but why not just get everyone to go every show, sell every show out? <laughs> yeah, man. Why not? Why not? That's, why the, not? These shows do pretty much sell out, though, don't they? Like the last few. Oh yeah. It was pre-pandemic, but the um, the ones at Kamikaze in Coventry um, were always at the Empire. I think the Empire maybe maybe on a good day can hold like three hundred ish, maybe, and they were always packed out, and there were always people waiting to come in. Like, there's been a real big boom, and these shows do pretty much sell out every time. So why not? I think I think they can. Exactly, like Wrestle Island, they've sold out yeah, so TNT. They're pretty much selling out uh, near enough every show. Superstar that we've just got started. Um, they're selling out tickets. There's there's loads. Um, what was it? Uh, Britannia Wrestling. They'd sold out as well. It's like mm-hmm. this is what this is what we want to see. We want to see these shows selling out. It's a good product. They're all good products, and they're filling up with brilliant talent. Because let's be honest, British wrestling at the minute is producing some of the best talent. I. I I'd say in the world, never mind just in the UK. Some of the talents that that we've seen in the scene at the minute are absolutely ridiculous what they're doing. So let's just give them the platform. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and get them paid as well because it's a a competitive business, isn't it? More and more people over the years with the rise of social media and the rise of like things like the WWE network giving more access to to wrestling fans and young wrestling fans there is more and more competition for people trying to get into the business um, especially on the women's side of things as well so oh. you know there's some incredibly talented women at the minute is here's a question actually I, I didn't even think of this um do you do you ever get involved in intergender 
breasts. Have you ever had many matches against women? Um, I haven't, no. Um, it's not something that I'm against, but it's you know it's just something that hasn't hasn't uh, fell into my wheelhouse at the minute. Mm. Not to say that I wouldn't, but yeah, I've not had the uh, the good fortune of wrestling any women at the minute. But there's that many women at the minute that are, that are on the scene that are absolutely killing it. It's like, why would you not want to mix it up with them? You know, they're yeah. just as good, if not better, than some of the lads that are on the scene. Yeah, I yeah, just yeah. mix it all up together. Yeah, I've spoken to a few independent. I've had um, Maria May on not too long ago, um, and she was saying she loves wrestling men because it's it's one of them things like it was hard for women because there's not many all women schools, and there certainly weren't in the last sort of like five ten years. So they have to mix it up with the men, but they're they're all happy that they did it because it it mentally and physically prepares you for literally anything ahead. I had jazz uh, as in WWE jazz on recently. When she was in ECW, she just always wrestled men and she said that it was the best thing that ever happened to her. You know? So I remember training with um, Harley Hudson. Uh, I don't think she'll mind me shouting this out, but she can half knock the hell out of some people. <laughs> like, I've, I've trained with her before and I, me being me, I'm like, because I'm obviously getting on a bit and stuff like that, I'm quite protective of, of like my friends and stuff and I didn't want to hurt her. So I was just tapping her and she's like, no, you need to hit me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I really don't want to. I don't want to hurt you. And she went, you're not going to hurt me. I said, I promise you I'll hurt you before you hurt me. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I laid one in and she come firing back at me with this shot. I was like, wow. Oh, okay. I was not prepared for that. So I think with anyone who's like a bit tentative about wrestling women, no, nah, they're, they're fine. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. They can, they can sort themselves out. <laughs> Yeah, they've spent so many years sort of like fighting that stigma, haven't they? And having so much to prove that they're just like, yeah, fuck it, let's go. Let's just go, they, fight me. They shouldn't have anything to prove, though. They're just, no. they, you know what I mean? They should, they, they deserve everybody's respect. They're there to be, they're there to do what they want to, what, what they want to do, just as much as we are. So we should be applauding it. If they want to go and fight men, they should fight men. That's entirely up to them. Yeah, man, I'm a big advocate for women's wrestling. Always have been. Um, right, tell me, tell me about John Gresham then. How how did that come about? Because as far as I'm concerned, he's he's an outside name for one of the best wrestlers in the world at the minute. What he's been doing in Ring of Honor, obviously before Ring of Honor has unfortunately gone on a break, was second to none in the pure division. He's incredibly talented. How did how did that opportunity present itself? Um, I've been a fan of his for quite some time. Um, to a point where I was on Instagram for a bit, shouting him out, <laughs> learning loads of new techniques and stuff from, um, I think it was Octopus University he had on YouTube. Hmm. So I had like a run of like every week that I was on a show, I was going to put a new one of his techniques into one of his matches. Hmm. And one of them got seen by him and he's, he's liked it and stuff and he followed me on Instagram, so I was made up. Anyway, fast forward a few years later and stuff and um, it, it popped up on, um, I think it was Wrestle Carnival. Um, that they were having a show and it was going to be headlined by Chris Ridgway and Jonathan Gresham. And I was like, instantly, like, this match is going to be insane. It's going to be mental. And then just after they announced that, they announced the seminar. So immediately went, right, I'm buying two tickets. That's it. We're, we're doing it. So I told me, mate, Tom, um, listen, I've bought you the ticket. Uh, you need to just, you need to go. I don't care if you're in work. Just cancel it. The phone in sick. Doesn't matter. Like, we'll just get there. And he was like, oh, dude, I don't even know if I've got a job yet. Never mind. Like, so I was like, anywho, doesn't matter. If if you don't have to pay, if you don't have to pay me for this ticket. Just there you go. So anyway, we get there. And yeah, it, it was just, you know, when I call it a penny drop. So you have this like sudden realization and everything seems to make sense. And I had like about five or six of them on the spin, just watching him. And it was only stupid little tiny things that you would have never thought of. Like, it's the most minute detail, but it, it makes everything so much bigger. And I was like, okay. <laughs> the intricate levels of detail that he goes into just for something as small as a wrist lock. And how that can then progress out. It was like, right, okay. My whole view of technical wrestling I mean I do love technical wrestling it's something I want to get better at but I know it's not something that I'm amazing at 
Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm nowhere near on Jonathan Gresham's level. I don't think I ever will be, to be completely honest. But it's something that I would aspire to be, and that's what I want to learn more of the the actual technical side of it, the grappling side of it. So, yeah, to see him break something down that every, that I think every match in its existence has had a wrist lock in it at some point. For him to then put a little, just a a little bit of something else on it, it's like that's yeah, okay, like, I'm interested. So did you take anything that you learned from that and actually like physically use it to adapt your style or to like change your, your game up at all? Was there anything that you, I don't know, you, you, you say that there were loads of penny drops. Was there anything that you like physically have integrated into like your moveset or, or what you do in the ring or anything like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's been a few. Um, I mean, I can't be giving me tools away <laughs> over a podcast because <laughs> people are going to start, start picking out the arsenal quick, but... Um, now, there's a few things that I've picked out from it that I'm, I've definitely, impl- definitely implemented into my game. But it's also opened a door for me to allow more of my martial arts game through as well. So it's been a nice... I think it's it's, it's the thing that I've, I've needed to actually open that door finally now when it's like, right, okay, I can I can mesh these two together and make something... I, I, I'm aiming to anyway, make something a little bit different than just martial arts dude does pro wrestling. Yeah, and that's good because we don't... Um, I had another guest on recently who's sort of got like a similar background to you. You don't see, other than we've had like on TV anyway, Ronda Rousey, Sonia Deville, I guess you could count Brock Lesnar. You don't see many MMA slash UFC taekwondo judo styles anymore, do you? You had, you had them sort of like a little bit more during the Attitude Era period of WWF. You had like people like Steve Blackman and that, but you don't really see that kind of physicality anymore. I think Tay Conti, you could probably count because she does a little bit of that as well. I think that's like Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. It used to be it used to be much, much more common. And it's strange that it isn't now because UFC is so much bigger than it ever was and MMA is so much bigger than it ever was. So like is was that always the style that you wanted to do, but you've just not really had an opportunity? Because I, I imagine you've not had many opponents that are sort of used to that style either, have you? Um, I think it's a it's a double edged sword because there's there's arguments for and against. So I, I'm obviously massive into Japanese wrestling, like Japanese strong style and King's Road and yeah. and that them styles of wrestling. There, you know, something that I'm really into. I'm also a big fan of comedy wrestling. So you know, you take what you will. But um, <laughs> I think if you've got like likes of MMA and pro wrestling, if you wanted to go and see uh, an MMA competition, then you just go and watch that. Same as if you wanted to just go and watch a storyline, you'd watch that. But I think somewhere in the middle, there is this perfect mix of the two that you could take that one guy out and put him into MMA and he wouldn't look any different and take him out of the MMA and put him into pro wrestling and it wouldn't look any different. There, there is that mix there. Um, Crossover-wise with moves and stuff, that there, there is, you know, there is that. And I think it's trying to make it accessible for... You know, if, if an MMA fan went to a pro wrestling fight and watched, um, I don't know, Brock Lesnar, you'd be like, oh, he recognises him, but then can appreciate and understand the work in which that he does with his pro wrestling. That's something I'm trying. I mean, I'm, I've never fought in MMA or anything like that, but it's something I want to try and bring the martial arts side that I've had from, like, from karate and bring that over. So you know that I've done the martial arts stuff, but then focus on the pro wrestling as well. So be able to tell a story with it as opposed to just... He does a few moves. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. That's that's a good point, actually. Like, um, I like how you you mentioned like separating the wrestling from the MMA. I've never really thought about it that way before. But yeah, you, you're right. There are a lot of these guys. If Brock Lesnar had only ever done one or the other, would you be able to just place him in the other and it be a natural fit? I've never really thought about it that way. Like Sonya Deville, uh, Shayna Baszler would be a really good one. Like, obviously, she's been really successful in both wrestling and in. MMA, but like, could you, if if she'd only done one or the other, I don't, I don't know if I'm wording that very well. Yeah, it's, it's whether or not you can put them in the other one, and like for me, it's like it's like taking a square peg and being able to put them into two different other holes. Will it, will he fit? Will he not fit? Will it will it look right? Because it's all well and good having like if you put Hulk Hogan in an MMA cage, it looked ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? It just it just wouldn't look normal. Do you know what I mean? It'd be like... Uh, no, I'm all right, thanks. No. Trying to fly and like, drop people in the middle of a fight. Like, it's not going to work. 
<laughs> oh god. Uh, I want to see that happen now. Go back like <laughs> that happened. Oh man. That's a horrible, horrible thought. Like I'm just picturing it now. Uh, just this blonde mullet flying through the earth. Like, no, I'm alright. <laughs> horrible. Thank you for that so much. <laughs> Right, I wanted to ask, um, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask, because I noticed something that you tweeted about, I think it was about four or five days ago, um, about mental health. And obviously, mental health is something that's been more of a talking point than ever, especially in the last few years. And again, with the rise of social media, um, we've seen more and more of it mentioned within wrestling as well. Um, People taking breaks, Bray Wyatt being a really, really like big recent case of that, having to step away because he was having having issues there um, and not feeling good. So I hope you don't mind me asking, but is, um, is oh, mental something that you've struggled with within wrestling? Because it doesn't seem like the most mental health friendly industry, does it? Lots of big macho men around sort of everybody trying to like one up each other, that, that sort of environment. It seems like a very like lads, lads, lads environment at times. And I imagine women probably struggle in that environment as well. I know I've had my, fair share of mental health struggles as well so is it is it something that's difficult to to look after within wrestling um i, I mean I, i'm not entirely sure to be completely honest um i've had my own obviously i've had my own struggles with mental health from one thing of another and things like that, and they were prior to prior to coming into professional wrestling but i think that there is i think there is some sort of stigma with regards to you know British wrestling and how it looks after its mental health and things like that. But at the same time, I think there could obviously be a lot more. There could be a lot more done to you know, to help out, uh, especially with. So there's, there's a lot to be honest. There's a lot to unpack with it. Um, it's reliant upon the individual. Obviously, they've got to they've got to be able to seek the help as well. But there should be help there for them as well, irrespective. Um, with regards to the women. Um, it can be a lads, lads, lads environment, but that's something I think that people are trying to quash. I think we're trying to make it more of a community as opposed to an environment because a community should be for everyone. That's how I view it anyway. Communities are for everyone. An environment is for specifics and we shouldn't be dealing with specifics anymore. We shouldn't be isolating people. We shouldn't be isolating groups. Um, irrespective of gender, sexuality, race, whatever, it, it doesn't matter, and it, nor should it matter. Um, but yeah, mental health is a big talking point at the minute with regards to British wrestling. People needed to take breaks, and if that's what they need to do, then that's what they need to do. Um, yeah. And hats off to them. Like we've all had our struggles. I've had mine. Um, yeah, I've been on antidepressants since I was twenty-seven. I've not had them for three years now, so yeah, wow. I've done okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 difficult getting off them. I've, I God, when did I? I must have been mid-teens, maybe, when I sort of late teens when I started taking them. I'm 32 now, and it's only been a couple of years since I've stopped taking them. Um, the worst thing that you can do is, is like you say, not take a break and not um, not acknowledge the fact that there's something going on and not take that time for yourself. And I think maybe people that are in the industry don't want to let people down. They don't, obviously, it's their only job, and they don't, don't want to let their families down, don't want to let their colleagues yeah. down, or... Let's say you're somebody like a Bray Wyatt. I know that's just the best example I can think of at the minute. Someone like a Bray Wyatt who's got a couple of young kids, only has the one job, works for a huge national corporation like WWE. You don't want to let anybody down. We, we have no idea how long he's been struggling with those mental health issues. Brody Lee dying as well. We know that, that that affected him as well. And he just kept wrestling and kept going. And that can do so much more damage and is already, you know what I mean? Like you, you want to, you want to keep going, and you want to keep, you want to say like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'll keep going. Best thing for me to do is to just crack on, and that can be so much more painful. Yeah, I mean, I can only speak from my experience. Um, that I, when I was learning to how to, to talk about my mental health and how to communicate with about it a bit more, like a bit better, and things like that, I used to see it as a sign of weakness, like it was. Um, like, 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 I, I was admitting something that that I should I should be ashamed of, or um, I shouldn't be feeling this way because you know I've I've got all these good things going on in life and I'm usually quite happy and positive, and then all of a sudden I'm I'm not feeling myself, I'm not feeling that way anymore. But I think you need to get rid of this stigma, and 
it, this goes out to anyone as well. If anyone's struggling with anything to do with mental health, just reach out, talk to me, talk to whoever. It doesn't matter. Just talk to someone because I would sooner just you drop me a text than be speaking at your funeral. Simple as that. So, that's, so talk. <laughs> yeah, not to put too fine a point on it, but yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, did talk about it before it's too late. No, I completely agree. Um, but no, thank you for that. I just want I just wanted to get your thoughts on it really quickly. I know it's a bit of a like I say, it's something that people don't really want to talk about, but it's good to hear other people talking about it as well because I think that can help inspire people to, you know, it is it is admittedly difficult. It really is, but honestly, that first conversation. Is, is the it's the hardest, but it's the best one to have. Yeah. Then once you've had that first one out of the way, it it'll, it honestly it'll get easier. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, right. So here's another thing that I, I was really keen to find out about. Um, I noticed on, <clears throat> on social media again in your Twitter bio that you're a brand rep for Hemophilia Heroes. What's what's that all about then? So how how does that come about? Is that something that's sort of like close to your heart or? Um, what it is is me best mate. Um, his son has hemophilia. Right. Um, you might be looking to interview him at some point, Tommy Jackson. Um, he's um, he's now come into the business and he's doing quite well for himself. But before then, he organised uh, a charity in line with the Haemophilia Society. Um, the Haemophilia is like a really rare blood disorder where the blood doesn't clot properly. So things that we take for granted, like walking into a table, for example, and getting a little graze on your leg could be a hell of a lot worse for young Jack. So we organised uh, Haemophilia Heroes, um, set up this little charity that donated the money to Haemophilia Society. Um, they started getting all clothing and bits like that. So I really hadn't really had any merch at the time. So I was like, well, if you want me to, and I'll just walk out with your stuff and get people to buy that. So we ended up doing that instead. And they just really kind enough to make me, own, make me very first T-shirt um, as, a, as a brand rep. So, yeah, it's gone off ever since then. Yeah, it's really nice. It's really nice. I, I, I wasn't sure. Like, I knew a little bit about what haemophilia was, but I didn't really know how it affected people, and especially kids. That's horrible. And is it is it something that's how how does the um how does the charity go towards supporting people with haemophilia? Is it just sort of like research and like and like looking into into what they can do to help? Is is it is it that kind of charity, or is it more of like an awareness thing, or? There's a lot, to be honest. They do a hell of a lot. So they'll do research. Um, they'll, they'll obviously contribute towards research, but then they'll, they'll do things for like um, like events and days to take them out and raising awareness. So um, I think they took them to an event a few, I think it was either last year or the year before, something like that, where they took like the parents. Um, as like a, I can't remember where they took them. They took them to an event anyway, and Jack had been able to go with them as well. So it, it obviously pays towards the training as well because mm. Tom's had to train how to like inject Jack with like the, the certain drugs that he needs and things like that. So yeah, it it, it spreads quite thin the money, but they, what what they do there is absolutely amazing work for Grant's with. Mm, very nice, man. Yeah, it's um not it's not not one of the i don't think many people i think if you would say hemophilia to people they wouldn't have a clue what it is it's not it's not very like widely talked about is it very widely discussed it's one of them things that you you only really hear about it when something happens with it yeah it's not that common um yeah it, it's so i can't remember the number but it's one in like oh i can't remember that i'm not even going to chance it but it's a, it's a <laughs> ridiculous number it's like it's not that common so obviously not a lot of people are going to read it but then when when you hear about it and how it affects certain things like some people can't even go for a walk generally wow. in, in case something happens um if they take a tumble and they might fall over and you might get a graze and that's them bleeding for the rest of the day and obviously if me and me or you fell over we'll be all right we'll just get up dust have a leg and we'll go yeah whereas someone else isn't that fortunate which is you know it's mental i don't think i'd be all right i'd complain about it all day yeah, I'd be like, I'd be making a point of it. <laughs> I'd make a bigger deal out of it than I needed to. Like, but, but yeah, I know what you mean. In generally, speaking, I need chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I want to. I want to go back to the very start. Um, I know I said at the, at the beginning of the interview, I didn't want to ask the same questions that everybody does about who are your favourite wrestlers, all that kind of stuff. But 
Was there anybody, obviously you, you got into the uh, martial arts side of things. Was there any, and, and you were a wrestling fan as well already at that point, you always wanted to be a wrestler. Was there any wrestler in particular that like inspired that style? Because obviously I, I assume as a kid, you wouldn't have just fallen into martial arts. You must've seen it somewhere or maybe movies. It could have been a character in something. Was there anything that really made that part of you come alive, wanting to get into it? Um. I'd say it was Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee, definitely. Um, and Power Rangers, obviously. So I used to watch loads of martial arts films with my dad. Um, Power Rangers, anything to do with X-Men and Spider-Man, the cartoons, the, the original cartoons as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I think I was watching WCW on Saturday morning, just before I went rugby training. And was hooked on it ever since. Um, but then obviously as, as time progresses, like, there's, there's been loads of like martial arts that have gone into wrestling and vice versa and things like that. Like, um, look at like my, one of my favorites, for example, Minoru Suzuki, yeah. the modern godfather of MMA. I could talk about him until the cows come home. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he's one of my favorites of all time. You've got Steve Blackman as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's just like a, there's a long list. And I think obviously when you've, when you've done something for that long, like I don't. I didn't just want to not incorporate it into the style of wrestling that I want to. I want. I want to go into. I want to be able to utilize that and use bits of it and things like that. So, yeah, looking at looking at it, I'd probably say them. Katsuyori Shibata as well. Some amazing names in there. I'm just. I'm just like trying to rack my brains and think of more. But I wasn't really. I wasn't really a WCW kid growing up. I was. I was like heavily WWE. I don't think I even really knew of. WCW until guys started coming over from WCW. I was more like inspired by by the smaller guys, like like your Rey Mysterios and that. But um, God, who would have been who would have been before them? Like your Chris Benoit's and people like that. Well, as I say, once they started coming over from WCW, um, just it's always it's always interesting to find out what people watched and grew up loving because basically nobody I talked to watched WCW. Although you are you are a few years older than me, so maybe that's it. I think sort of that like mid thirties crowd tended to watch WCW more. Did you have did you have many friends who watched wrestling at the time? Because I was pretty much the only one at school. Um, no, it was me and my best mate Lee. Um, none of us had Sky, um, so yeah. we just watched what was on Terrestrial, and I think that was on either I can't remember it was on Channel Four or Five something like that. But for in the weekdays before school for me, it was like eight o'clock in the morning, yeah. seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, something daft like that. And then we used to be able to watch it over weekend. That you get like would you get like a new episode on a Saturday? Pretty sure you would. Oh no, that was on um Yeah, it was. You get a new episode on Saturday mornings and then you play like bits of it throughout the week. What would have been I think it would have been um what would have been like the B show at the time? It would have been like um Heat, wouldn't it? You obviously had you had Monday Night Raw and then you'd have had Heat and main event and stuff like that. Yeah, I think they just showed repeats of it throughout the week. I think, like you say, they broke down the couple of hours and showed it in, like, half an hour segments in the morning, something like that. I can't really remember. Yeah, yeah. 25 years ago. Uh, I just remember we had, um, it was always on. Yeah, we had we had WCW because, obviously, we couldn't get Sky. So, we, I think we used to get it off, like, a Saturday. Sure, it used to be, like, a Saturday morning um, where you'd watch, like, the highlights of... of the, the show gone and stuff like that. Um, we ended up did getting Sky at the end, like eventually, but by that time it was like, yeah, it, by that time, like I think Steve Austin was on his way out, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we, we we managed to get bits. Like we used to go to a video shop that was around the corner from us, and we'd rent like WrestleMania and stuff, and we'd get ECW as well, which we probably shouldn't have had at the time. But <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. If they don't know, then just don't tell them. <laughs> Yeah, my neighbour used to, this was before I had, I didn't have Sky or, oh, it was NTL as well, wasn't it, back then? I think they had like a, a TV Sky type service, NTL World or something like that. Yeah. I didn't yeah. have access to any of this. So my neighbour used to tape it. The first event I ever watched was Mania 17. Um, yeah, it was it was tough if you didn't have, if you didn't have Sky or anything like that. I, I can't really remember. But when I did eventually get it, I'd sort of got a bit bored. And I was of that age where I was like 15. Should I still like wrestling? 
a, a, a girl's going to make fun of me for liking wrestling? No, so I wasn't bothered about girls. I was like, no, if it's not two dudes knocking lumps out of each other, I'm not interested. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I, I, I just tried to be interested in girls, but like subdue the wrestling side of me. Like I was, every girl I met, I really wanted to be like, did you watch Raw on Monday? Knowing that they didn't watch Raw on Monday. It's hard. It's hard, hard <laughs> subduing it. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, mate, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you a little bit more and getting to know your background and your interests and, and the stuff that you've got going on as well. Um, the last question that I want to ask you, it's, it's a recurring segment I'm going to do with all of my independent guests, and it's it's simply called Put Yourself Over. So I want to give you a few minutes to basically just explain to viewers and listeners why they should be paying attention to you, where they can find you, any shows that you've got coming up soon. You can do a promo, do whatever it is that you want. Just sell yourself. You've got like three minutes or however long you want. I don't even care. Just go for it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, this is the hard bit now. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, now. <laughs> well, I'm not going to cut a promo, but um, you can, um, you should be watching me uh, because I'm five foot seven. I am a little wrecking ball of British wrestling. I'm bald. I'm part of the bald assholes with me and Simon Miller from What Culture. A yeah. uh, little name drop there. Um, I'm due to make my international debut this Friday or Saturday in Belgium, uh, if all goes well, fingers crossed. And yeah, come and watch me kick lumps out of people who are twice the size of me because it's fun and you will have fun and you are supporting British wrestling. And if you're supporting British wrestling, you are supporting me. That's all good. Absolutely, absolutely. I completely forgot. I, I, I did notice the um, the Simon Miller team. How did how did that come about? Um, it come about from a rumble because we're both bald, and I touched his head, and he touched mine, um, and that's how it that's how it was born. <laughs> and all great tag teams should should be formed, isn't it? <laughs> we were like, oh my god, you're bald, you're bald, and then we eliminated uh, synergy and. Started from there, so, yeah. We've got something in common. <laughs> That's nice Literally and simple. That. <laughs> Don't make it, it too complicated. Like, oh, how can we? How can we be a team? What? Can we, what gimmick can we create? It's like, no, no, no. You're bold. I'm bold. Go. That'll do. I love it. That's it. We'll run with it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant Brian mate like I said thank you so much for joining me man uh, before I let you go where can people find you on social media uh, you can find me on Twitter Facebook and Instagram I think the only one uh, is Twitter which is Brian Adenson one everything else is just Brian Adenson um, I am going to be setting up a YouTube at some point uh, so more on that probably going to be next year now but uh, yeah that's my social medias get following and yeah We'll see you there. Very nice. Is the YouTube just sort of going to be like collections of your matches and stuff like that? It'll just be bits of everything. Uh, whatever anyone's interested in, to be honest, I'll try and make it as whatever anybody wants to watch. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. I'll put all of that in the um, in the about section as well once this podcast goes out, guys. So if you want to you want to check out Brian, all the links will be there. So you can go ahead and follow him, subscribe to whatever you need to do while you're here. And while you're there, make sure you hit subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Hit follow if you're listening on any audio platforms. Brian, once again, I know I've said it like three times, but thank you so much for giving me your time. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to shine a bit more of a spotlight onto independent wrestling and the awesome hard work that you guys are doing. Everybody, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I will hope to catch you next time on It's My Wrestling Podcast. Mm -hmm.